So Matthew 28 is a well-known scripture. Hopefully all of us know it, but the sad reality is what is called the Great Commission is oftentimes turned into the Great Omission. That means the very directions that we're given as God's church and God's people, while it is how we are commissioned to go and change the world, unfortunately, the most of the church around us, the cultural Christianity that we live in has turned it into the great omission. So we go to church on Sunday and maybe we open our Bible once a week, but making disciples is something that we're not really a part of. And we see that in churches, right? There's statistics that prove that church plants, when people first go out and plant churches, are, so, are enormously more fruitful and enormously more um, beneficial than old churches. Because a lot of times what happens is churches age, it can become comfortable, and we're so blessed with the things that God gives us, but then we can become complacent. And the thing that starts the church can dwindle, and it can become something that's an afterthought. And so when I look at this church, I realize that God started this church on the campus. And even as we grow as a church, we're sell- we've been a church for over a decade, I say decade because that makes it sound like we're real old. Um, But God still wants to do the same thing over and over again. Some of us may feel like that's boring, but when you experience a life being changed by the gospel, there's nothing more exciting than that moment. When somebody gets down on their knees, like Darian was saying, his sophomore year in his bedroom, confessing that Jesus is Lord of their life, repenting from their old way and turning to a new way of following Jesus and giving their life to them. And from that very moment, it's exciting in that moment, but it's exciting when you look back over a decade and you see all that God has done through that one moment of transformation. In Matthew 28, we see this moment where Jesus gathers with his disciples up on the mountain. This is the last conversation that Jesus has with his disciples before he leaves earth. And he gathers them together. And the reality is, is he gathers them together. And it says that they worshiped him just like we worshiped this morning, but that some of them doubted. Some of them doubted. Doubted. You mean the disciples that walk with Jesus in the flesh, that saw him go up on the cross, that saw the, the holes in his hands, that saw him raise again from the dead, some of them doubted? They doubted? Can I be honest with you? Sometimes I doubt. Sometimes I'm not sure if God really wants to continue to move through my life. Sometimes I doubt if the things that God has done through me are really real, if they're really significant, if the lives that I've seen change, if it really matters that much. Sometimes I doubt if it's worth continuing to invest in in hard places and places where you don't always see immediate returns. And sometimes I doubt if Jesus is really moved in my life and really changed my life. I deal with doubt. And I think it's okay. Okay. Because the disciples that gathered up on the hill, they dealt with doubt too. And when you see in James, it says that if anyone lacks, let him ask of God. But ask in faith with no doubting. See, as we gather, and even this morning, I realized that one thing that we're all going to face this morning as we gather, as we talk about strategy, as we talk about the Great Commission, something that we're all going to have to wrestle with is doubt. And doubt is something that we'll all face, but what we cannot allow doubt to do as a church is we cannot allow doubt to become our direction. You can't follow your doubt. Your doubt won't take you anywhere good. It'll take you away from fruitfulness. It'll take you away from generational blessings. It'll take you away from all that God desires to pour out in your life. So family, don't follow the doubt. Follow the promise. That God promised in Matthew 28, he promised in Acts 1 that he pours his spirit out on his sons and his daughters. That he's not done working, he's not done moving. College students that gather here today, it's not just you. There's more college students that God desires to move in their life. There's more people that God desires to transform. Amen? Anyone believe that this morning? Come on, I know doubt's a real thing, but is faith the real thing this morning? Is faith the real thing this morning? Is there anyone that believes that there's still people in the next generation that are going to be set apart and holy and love Jesus and they're going to grow up and they're going to grow healthy families and they're going to love their children and they're going to love their wives? Is there anyone that has faith for that this morning? (laughs) Acts 1, 7 through 8 is this picture that Luke then paints. The first one's by Matthew, the second one's by Luke and it's the same moment with Jesus. And the disciples are still wondering about Israel. When is God going to restore Israel? But what God is doing is not just about Israel. He's saying it's about the nations. 
that God came for the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. But they're worried about Israel. But Jesus replies, the father alone has the authority to set those dates and times. And they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. Telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, through Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. See, Jesus is telling them that the Holy Spirit will come and fill them and give them power to be witnesses. Where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. He's saying in your neighborhood, in your family, Jerusalem. He's saying in your community, in your state, um, in the places around you, Judea and Samaria. And he's saying in every single nation, to the ends of the earth, God's going to empower you. Family, God's going to empower us as a church. He cares about the campus, but he also cares about the nations. Come on, we want to reach the nations. We want to see God move not just in our city. We want to move him to, to see him move across the world. And Jesus, he has this heart for the nations. He cares about the nations. But what Jesus does because he cares about the nations is he goes and he raises up 10, 12 young leaders in Israel. 12 Israelites, he raises them up in order to go reach the nations. Young adults, he doesn't pick the people that are old. He doesn't pick the religious. He doesn't, he doesn't pick the experienced. He picks the young adults, the 18 through 25. He picks them, and he spends every day with them for three years, imparting in them, pouring in them, that they would be the ones, the ones that nobody would expect to go and change the world. And you see throughout Acts, you see it's not even by choice, it's by persecution that once Stephen dies, that the disciples begin to scatter and begin to go throughout the world, all the way reaching what they would have seen as the ends of the earth, right? Reaching the different nations, sharing the gospel, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so as we gather as a church, I believe that God's still doing the same thing. And that you young people that are gathered here, myself included, (laughs) that God has a plan for your life, right? 2 Timothy 2.2 says, And these things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust them to reliable people. (laughs) I'll just laugh because sometimes you wouldn't uh, think college students as reliable people. Um, (laughs) But some of you, God is forming into reliable people that are steadfast, that are focused on his mission, focused on his will. And when you're reliable people, you're going to stand out in the world around you. You're reliable not because you're built on sand, but because you're built on the rock. Come on. That will also be qualified to teach others. This good thing that God has started in this church, it has changed, it has shifted over the years. And as I look at it, I realize that we are not going to be the ones that are going to continue it. The ones that are to come after us, our children, the, pe- the kids that are going to play in the kids' wing, the kids that are on campus that don't even know Jesus yet, they're the ones that are going to continue. As a church, we have this strategic plan that I call the arrow. Um, That is our strategic plan to continue to revive and develop and send as a church. And so this is what I want to get into a little bit today with the time that we have. My heart today is that you would understand that we reach the campus, not because we just care about the campus. We reach the campus because we believe that Jesus cares about the world. And we want to reach the world through the campus. So as we look at this, revive, develop, send, as a church, we want to make disciples. And we believe that everybody from this church is called to make disciples. In your, everywhere that you go, called to make disciples. But as a church, we have an emphasis on making disciples on the campus because we believe that it is strategic, and we're going to get into that. And, we, and as we raise up campus leaders, as we support and love our youth, It pours into the congregation. Our church is here because of the campus. Every single one of you is here in some way, maybe as a byproduct from what has happened on the campus. As we raise up student leaders, as we raise up people who feel called to make disciples, which every single person as a disciple should be called to make disciples. As we raise them up, they might go into ministry. Maybe one or two percent of them will go into full-time ministry. One or two percent. But majority will go into the marketplace, into their location, vocation, recreation, and both of them will be fruitful. All of us should be fruitful, not just campus missionaries, not just full-time pastors. All of us are called to be fruitful. But don't doubt. Have faith, right? Have faith. you got to have faith. This is by faith 
So as we build up people, as we make disciples, as we mobilize ourselves in order to make more disciples, and then we have this program called D-U-L-I, stands for Divine Unity Leadership Institute. Any graduates from D-U-L-I in here this morning? Come on, we got one, Allison, come on. <laughs> There's a lot more, but Allison, I'm glad you came. There's one more in the back. I see a hand, I can't see a face. <sighs> Mama Jenny, <laughs> of course. You know Mama Jenny's not going to miss a service. Okay. But we build up leaders, and the reason we desire to do that is we want to, we want to continue to build leaders, and we want to com- continue to plant churches in every nation. We want to send leaders, send people who understand how to live and serve God well into every nation. So this is, this is how we think through as a church. We want to strategically do this. Campus is not the only thing we care about. Campus is not the only people we want to reach. But this is a strategic way that we stay on mission in order to build up leaders. Amen? So I want to talk about 10 reasons. Everybody say 10 reasons. We do campus ministry. 10 reasons we do campus ministry. The first one, historically most major movements, whether good or bad, start on college campuses. When you look at college students, something about them is they have extremely high mobility, right? That does not mean they're flexible, right? That means that they're able to go and be a part of social movements because there's less college students, especially undergrad, that have kids and a family and an established life. They're extremely mobile. They also are very energetic, right? (laughs) But the college students, they have energy. Student-driven moments have reshaped national policies, social norms, and even global perspectives. Highlighting the critical role of the campus in societal change. The campus is how we change the world. Currently, when we look at the world around us, a lot of the social movement is towards a post-Christian world. We are no, it is no longer rebellious to not go to church. Now it's becoming rebellious to go to church. Praise God. I'm kind of glad about that because we're the college students are rebels by nature, right? But when we look at the church as a whole, actually in Europe and North America, the church is struggling. It is struggling. Listen, I know you are enjoying the message right now. We want to give you just a quick testimony. Man, we are hearing so many testimonies about people who are being impacted by this gospel message. Hey, will you consider financially partnering with this ministry so we can get it out to as many people as possible? We're hearing testimonies from multi-generational folks. We're hearing testimonies of people who are in prison, people who are just coming to find Jesus. So make sure we keep this ministry going. Back to the message. Second reason, the available, trainable, Masses are found on the college campus. Where else will you find 30,000 college students in one place? But there's nowhere else in society where you'll find such a large group of future leaders that have the freedom to discover new ideas, question traditions, and embrace new visions of the future. And they're hungry, and they're motivated. College years are a critical time for identity formation. There's a study that says that 97% of people who come to Christ do so before the age of 30. 97%. And there's a huge group of of people that come to Christ between the ages of 4 and 14. And then there's also a group that comes between 18 and 25. And the reality is that for a lot of people that grow up in a faith tradition, it is easier and more often do you see that they give their life to Christ in those preteen ages. But a lot of times it's the students and the people that have not grown up in a faith background, that have not grown up in a Christian home, that they go to college and they're there for the very first time trying to establish their own belief systems and their own values. And it's at that place that a lot of times people will begin to follow Jesus and change generations. So it is a critical time for identity formation. On the flip side, 64% of young adults who grew up in church will walk away at some point during college years. It is easy as a college student, even with all the ministries around in the, in the different college ministries, it is easy as a college, college Christian to feel alone and isolated. And, and if you are in a dorm room, I don't know how many people, if there's any freshmen in here this morning yet, um, or, or anyone that lives in a dorm, but nothing's more lonely than a, a, a dorm on the weekend. I lived in a dorm for three years, and it was awesome. It was awesome. But on the weekend, everybody's out partying especially at the beginning of the year. And it's so easy to walk away from the faith. And that's why it's so important that we understand that the college years are critical time. Number four, the fourth reason, 
the values on campus will be the values of society in 10 years. That oftentimes we want to change the people who are so set on their values and we have all these arguments and we have all these, these disagreements on Facebook with you and auntie or whoever and all this stuff going on, right? And all this stuff. But you know who's going to, the, the values in 10 years will be the values that are on campus. And so we must, we must impart that we find value and we understand values in the Bible. That this God's scripture and God's word, that when there's students that grow up and they graduate and, and, and they move into life and they grow families, that they will find their values and develop their belief system on scripture. And that their heart behind loving the world would be rooted in God's word. The fifth reason is reaching international students fuels world missions. There's a million, over a million international students studying in the U.S. today. A lot of them come from closed nations. JMU itself has approximately 70 countries represented in their international student body. Globally, many of the countries that these students come from are considered unreached. This is critical considering that over 40% of the world's population lives in areas where there is limited or no access to the gospel. The future leaders of society pass through campus. According to Pew Research Center, one in three young adults in America currently attends college. One in three young adults. The U.S. Department of State reports that 70% of the world's future leaders study in American universities. Number seven, if you impact a student, you impact a whole family. This morning, Darian shared his testimony. He talked about meeting Jesus his sophomore year in his dorm room and getting connected and plugged in. But what Darian didn't share, um, that I think Darian should share next service, <laughs> is, is, you know, uh, that he's discipling his family. As we were coming back, we went and we had a senior leader that was visiting us this past week, um, which is why I may look tired if I look a little tired. <laughs> um, and we were taking him home to the airport. And Darian went with me, and we thought it was Dallas. It was actually Reagan, so it added a little bit of time to the trip. And we were coming back, having great conversation. And Darian was like, yeah, I got a discipleship call with my family tonight. And that was not new news to me. He's been doing that. He's been discipling his family. He's been doing the one-to-one -one with his family. His brother is a freshman at Mary Baldwin, right, Gio? Right, reaching the family. There's so many stories. A lot, some of you are in here because you, you were brought here because of somebody younger in your life. Number eight. To ignore our students is to surrender our students to the enemy. More than 60% of students meet the criteria for at least one mental health condition, such as anxiety, depression, or suicidal thoughts. The pandemic intensified those issues, with 70% of students reporting worsening mental health since starting college. So this is real, that the enemy is working on the campuses. He's working in our school systems. He's working in these places. And there's a reason. Because he knows. He knows what college students, he knows what you guys can do and be if you give your lives to Jesus. If you follow him with your whole heart. He knows the impact. He knows all this stuff that we're talking about. Number nine. Students bring vision, dedication, and energy to the church. Come on. Our church started on the campus and it continues on the campus. Um, so this church is here because the college students already said that. But if we go back to the do-rag days, any do-rag people in the house this morning? Do-rag do -rag stands for divine unity, righteously, apply, uh, righteously applying God. <laughs> right? I just want to shout out some people on here real quick. You can see Pastor Chris right here and Troy and Derek, the three founders on the left. And then you can see Marcus crying in the top left corner. Pastor Marcus. <laughs> Along with some other familiar faces. The tenth reason is that God has promised to pour out his spirit on his sons and his daughters. Acts 2, 17 through 18 says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see vision and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, young men and women alike, and they will prophesy. God has a promise to continue to pour out his spirit. He has to continue to continue to do work over and over again on the campus. And us as a church, we came from Durag and we continue to do college ministry. Now we're part of a network called Every Nation. And every nation, in, in our network, every church has a campus ministry. 
And the reason we have a campus ministry is we want to reach every nation through the campus. That's why we call it Every Nation Campus. If you look at the logo, the N is kind of hard to see and distinguish. But the N is in the middle, E-N-C, and nation. We want to reach every nation with the campus. We do. Everybody say, engage, establish, equip, empower. And some of the things that we do on campus in order to do this is we have one-to-one meetings. We meet with students. We sit down with them with a book called One to One, and we sit down, we pray with them, we talk to them, and we walk them through what does it mean to follow Jesus with the One to One book. And we also have large groups on campuses. This is the first year where we've had three large groups every week, three large groups every week at Mary Baldwin, EMU, and JMU. Come on, every week. Every week we have people gathering to worship, to talk about God's word. There's many churches, little tiny churches, basically, on every single campus. And we're believing for Bridgewater, that God's opening the door for Bridgewater as well. And we have life groups where students with with student leaders are gathering together and talking about God's word and, and growing and being established in faith and community. We have leadership and team building. We have amazing student leaders. And, and, and that's, a group, that's a picture of all of our student leaders on the left. And on the right is our amazing student leadership team at Mary Baldwin University. Right? And they drive. They come here. It takes them 40 minutes to come to church on Sundays. And they come down here. I want to honor them because I think God's doing something amazing in Stanton. We've, we're even believing that God will start a church in Stanton through them. Right? Um, so also, outreach and evangelism. We talk to students on campus, especially JMU because it's a bigger public university. There you see the, uh, the evangelist Robert Ricciuti with his counterpart Nadine Bogarty on the left um, preaching the gospel to students. We've seen students. This year is so it's interesting what's happening on, on campus. Um, I was there this past week, and I saw um, I had just gotten out. We, they had just um, started God testing, which is a way that we go up and we start to ask conversations and, um, with students and talk to them about God. And there were just people coming up to be God tested, to talk, have conversations about God. And I was with, um, with uh, Nick Jones, who's one of our senior leaders who came into the area to just encourage and impart. And he's like, is that normal? I was like, no, that's something new that God is doing that the students are desiring to know about God. So that's a big thing that we really emphasize on campuses. It looks a little bit different on different size campuses. Um, But we also go on international trips as well, which is something that we really want to start to ramp up more and more for different reasons. Um, So on the left, that is Robert and I had, Robert Trudy and I had the privilege to go to Fiji, um, Suva, and they had their first student conference ever for the Pacific Islands in Fiji. And Rob and I were able to help start that conference there in Suva. And on the right, we have a team that we sent to Peru, to Lima, that joined the church there. And we did just day after day after day of evangelism on campus. And it was very humbling because I do not speak Spanish and a lot of other people do. The beginning of the semester, we had Engage Month. And Engage Month is where we serve thousands, I kid you not, thousands of students, serving them coffee, getting to meet them, welcoming them, inviting them into relationship. Um, We saw so many amazing things happen. We had men on the mountain where we invited all these random dudes that we never met before. And it was super awkward up at first, up to this place on a mountain. It was beautiful. It was this beautiful moment. And we, we, we preached the gospel there. And 11 young men gave their life to Jesus on that day. And once a month, we've been gathering for this thing called the cave. And I want to highlight this real quick because tonight we're going to have our last cave. And it's going to be a blast. It's going to be fun. But the last one, we've been doing all these moments where we've been preaching the gospel over and over again at all these different events. And we had about 100 people that were at this, the last cave. And we said, hey, if anyone wants to give their life to Jesus tonight or if they gave their life to Jesus this semester, come forward. And about half the group of students, about half the group of students came to the front. And just to celebrate, we've, we've baptized 50 students as a church this year. 50 students as a church. Come on. I want to celebrate that BC officially became a club. Come on, let's celebrate that. We have three new campus missionaries in Joyelle, Olivia, and TM. We sent a missionary to Vir- Richmond, Virginia. We had 76 students that go to the fall retreat. These are amazing things. Come on, we can praise God for this. That God is still moving. He's not done in this church. He's not done through us. And in 2025, we're believing that God's going to do more, right? 
We're believing at the beginning of January, we're going to go to this conference. And conferences can just be moments and they can just be monuments if we're not using them to build momentum and continue the trajectory of what God is doing through lives on campus, right? The, the, the campus conferences won't do anything in of, them, of themselves, but they're special moments for us to build momentum in students' lives. And we're believing and we're praying, and you guys can pray with us, that we'll take 100 students to the conference in January. 100 students. We're going to pray for that. It says this, that remember this, whoever so sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. Family, some of you are maybe wondering, well, how does this apply to me because I wasn't reached on the campus? Or maybe you haven't had any impact on the campus. But to be a part of this church... It does not mean that you had to be impacted and reached on the campus. But my desire for us is that we do understand the call to reach the campus. That when we change the campus, we change the world. And that God has not called us to be a church that has campus ministry. He's not called us to be a church that has campus ministry. He's called us to be a church that does campus ministry. And so my ask this morning, um, I'm going to give some other ways where you can participate, but a big ask this morning where we can all contribute to campus ministry is to give towards these buses. Um, I'm believing that we'll be able to find a way to fund two buses for these students. Um, the students have to pay $199 in order for the conference itself, um, but we want to be able to pay for the buses to provide the transportation as a church for them to get there, that we're believing in faith, that the trip down there is going to be faith building, but the moment there is going to be faith building as well. So we want you, you guys to pray about that. Pray about a gift. And we want us to all give generously. Um, the second thing is other ways that we can contribute in campus ministry that I want to share with you guys. The first and foremost thing is do not underestimate the power of your prayer. Please pray for the campus. The stats that I read, the different things that are happening on campus, your prayers matter. Your prayers matter. I'm so glad that you have tuned in and spent this time with us. We hope that this message has blessed you. Hey, there are three ways we would love for you to respond. One, if you've never made a commitment to follow Jesus, this is your day. God loves you. He has a plan for your life. And he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. And Jesus rose from the grave, proving that he is the son of God, offering forgiveness and salvation for all those who believe. If that's you, this could be your day. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. We would love to help you along your spiritual journey. You can go to our website at duchurch.org backslash connect. You can find a small group or you can find a way where we could be praying for you. You can submit prayer requests or praise reports. We would love to hear from you. Secondly, we would love to invite you to be a financial partner of this media ministry as we're getting this out to as many people as possible and you can find information on our website www.duckchurch.org backslash give and lastly follow us on social media so you can stay in contact with us so you know what's happening god bless you thank you for being with us